three uh, cities mentioned, but actually we are going to present four because we also have a mystery guest. Uh, we've got first, we've got presentations, presential of three persons of uh, the city of Trojan from uh, Bulgaria. And we are honored uh, to have with us also the, the mayor of the city of uh, Trojan, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Uh, Donka Mijailova. Uh, we also have the city of Turin and the city of Copenhagen. But as you know, yesterday we were supposed to have a, a presentation also by the city of New York, by Nevin Cohen, who unfortunately it didn't work out, but we have now a recorded presentation of Nevin Cohen. So that's also all about the urban agriculture policy experience of New York. So we will put that in this session again. Uh, but first of all, uh, we want to start with the experience of the city of Trojan. Uh, so, Mayor, uh, I want to give you the floor if you can say something about the experience of uh, uh, the city of Trojan with the municipal uh, organic farm for preschool canteens. The floor is yours. Изключително ми е приятно, че сме част от тази конференция. А, град Роян е един а, не голям град, от, а, в който живеят около 20 хиляди жители в, в, в центъра на България. Казваме, че Троян е сърцето на планината, на Стара планина. Казваме го с а, особена любов. А, като ценим това, че ние живеем в един относително екологично чист район. В, предните, в предния модул а, долових настроение, че кметовете едва ли не трябва да бъдат убеждавани, че идеята за градско замеделие има смисъл. Ще ви покажа един модел, който е различен в който идеята идва от общината и нашата идея се роди много спонтанно, много не е планирано. Тя не е предмет на проект, финансиран от външни донори. Тя е едно желание децата на нашата община да се хранят природно съобразно. Какво всъщност се състои идеята ни? Някак си а, спонтанно ние решихме, че имаме собствени общински земи, в които можем с собствени усилия, в собствените на общината детски градини, с собствени средства, да направим а, храненето на децата по-здравословно. Това по само по себе си а, формира един затворен цикъл на общинско замеделие, което значително скъси виригата за доставка на храни в детските градини, доведе до здравословно хранене на децата и като че ли във времето все повече и повече разширяваме възрастовата характеристика на хората, които стават част от този модел. Ето как се зароди идеята. Изготвихме един анализ на здравословното хранене на децата, като сравнихме нашия модел на хранене с модела на хранене в съседни общини. По инициатива на Общинското ръководство въвлякохме широк кръг от заинтересованите страни в обсъждането на възможни и по-добри решения за подобряване на храненето. По този начин очертахме и проблемите, и възможните решения. Съставихме една програма за развитие на детското и училищното здравеопазване. 
И предприехме конкретни мерки за здравословното хранене на децата. Като о, предоставихме местни ресурси, най-вече, както вече казах, наши общински земи, за а, производството на храни. Избрахме терен, със собствени сили и средства създадохме един оранжериен комплекс, в който започнахме да засаждаме зеленчуци. Лук, марули, домати, чушки и а, така постепенно във времето, в годините разширявахме асортимента на зеленчуците, които са необходими за здравословното детско хранене. Комплекса, който създадохме, както виждате от снимката, включ, включва три тунелни оранжери. По-късно ни подариха кошери и започнахме производство на мед. В момента вече сме регистриран производител на мед. А, и започнахме извън оранжериите да отглеждаме картофи, тикви и тиквички, които децата обичат да похапват. Инвестицията, която вложихме, беше пределно скромна, напълно посилна за общинския бюджет, 10 000 лева или 5 000 евро, като о, в о, производството ангажирахме местни хора, Постоянно в оранжериите работи само един човек, като в периодите, в които е необходима повече работна ръка, привличаме служители на общината, а включваме и децата да помагат. Появи си е се необходимостта от съхранение на плодовете и зеленчуците, които произвеждаме. Беше ни дарено едно помещение от 100 квадрата, в което създадохме хладилни помещения и складове за съхраняване на плодовете и зеленчуците, тъй като част от тях са трайни, примерно ябълките, и те трябва да бъдат съхранявани за по-продължителен период от време. Ето пътя, който извървяхме. Започнахме с а, две овощни градини, Сливова и Ябълкова. Тук привлякохме научни работници, а, които ни помогнаха да подберем а, сортове в овощните градини, които изискват а, минимална допълнителна обработка с химикали. Устойчиви са и а, част от тях се произвеждат без абсолютно никакво влагане на а, химикали. В 2018 година станахме част от един проект по програма Урбакт, пределно скромно финансиран, в който проучихме опита на един френски град, Моан Сърту, а, който работи по подобен модел. След това, 2019 година, създадохме оранжерията. 2020 година, след това, създадохме пчелина, като непрекъснато разширявахме асортимента на произвежданите храни. Ето част от храните, които произвеждаме, които изглеждат по този начин. Ето и количествата, които в последните години, 21 и 22, произведохме. А, много близко сме до времето, в което а, очакваме всъщност тази година да произвеждаме ябълки, които напълно да задоволяват храненето на децата в детска млечна кухня, в детските ясли и в детските градини на територията на цялата община. А в определени моменти, особено а, по отношение на зелените салати, а произведената продукция се явява в излишък и я включваме в храненето на социалните институции и на възрастни хора, които всеки ден получават топла храна в 
в домовете си. Проектът, който създадохме, въвлече децата в нашите овощни градини и в оранжериите. Децата виждат как се засаждат зеленчуците, как се раждат и понякога се включват в брането. На снимката виждате децата от Дома за деца с увреждания. Те са в училищна възраст и се включват в брането на реколтата с усещането за това, че са полезни за техните по-малки братчета и сестри, които се хранят в детските градини. Тъй като ми казаха, че мога да говоря само 10 минути, приключвам с това какво считаме, че постигнахме? Считаме, че постигнахме една устойчива местна здравна и социална политика. Създадохме един модел за устойчиво градско земеделие, насочен изцяло към детското хранене. Създадохме една практика, въвлякохме уязвими групи. И от тук нататък ни предстои предизвикателството този модел да го пренесем в ученическото хранене, нещо, което се поставяме като цел за следващите 2-3 години. Благодаря ви за вниманието. Благодаря ви, Мейя, за този много интересно опитът Uh, the, the greenhouses and the school uh, canteens in uh, Trujan. I'm, sh I'm sure that there are uh, questions in the audience to know a little bit more. I would like to give the floor. I see one there. Go ahead. Uh, who's got the mic? Well, I will give it now. Um. Първото нещо, което исках да попитам е в учебните... Yeah, I will wait a second. Исках да попитам първо в учебните заведения, в които се консумират тези зеленчуци, каква част от диетата успявате да запълните с тях. И второ, как родителите, ако са въвлечени, как са въвлечени... Мислите ли, че този пример от училищата може да се пренесе и в домовете на децата и семействата? Мисли ли сте за възможности родителите да се включват в самото отглеждане и така нататък? Да уточним, че този модел в настоящия момент го прилагаме в детските градини и в детските ясли. Детска млечна кухня в България обхваща деца от 10 месеца до 3 години. Детската ясла по принцип деца над една година от една до три години и детските градини от три до седем години. Това са децата, които в момента обхващаме. Пропуснах да кажа това, че този модел дойде след промяна въобще на модела на хранене на децата в детските градини. Въведохме, назначихме на работа технолози и специалисти по детското хранене. Купихме нови съдове, които приготвят храната по здравословен начин. Създадохме една кухня за цялата община, която произвежда храна там на място и храната се транспортира до детските заведения като изключихме пърженето на храни, включихме пълнозърнес хляб, включихме много плодове и зеленчуци и считаме, че по този начин променяме навиците на децата и вкусовите предпочитания по отношение на храната. Ще ви призная, че в самото начало децата не харесваха зелените салати. Не обичаха марулята, не обичаха лука. Сега си ги похапват с удоволствие и това се пренася в домовете им. Реакцията на родителите е нееднозначна. Мисля, че 
няма родители, а, които не биха искали децата им да се хранят здравословно. А родителите не сме ги привличали в а, производството на плодовете и зеленчуците. На този етап се стремим да привличаме по-големите а, деца и ученици. Както казах, а, фокуса ни е насочен и към младежите с увреждания, а при които потребността от създаване на усещане за полезност е значителна. Thank you very much, Mayor, and interesting to see how this initiative to promote uh, local uh, gardens and local organic production, how at the same time it also promotes more healthy diet. So these things are going uh, hand in hand, and I suppose it's very uh, recognizable by many for many people that the children don't like to eat the vegetables, they want to leave their paprikas uh, behind. Someone else has maybe a question? Yes, right there in the back. Здравейте, аз имам два кратки въпроса. Първият ми въпрос е, а, инициативата стартира от а, гражданите или от общината, от администрацията? И вторият ми въпрос е, а, до каква степен а, искате да развиете про, а, тази, това производство и, а, и мислили сте да го мултиплицирате и да помогнете на градове като София, които имат определено нужда от такъв тип а, инициативи? Благодаря ви за вниманието. Всъщност, а, идеята а, дойде от а, един широк кръг а, хора, които имат интерес а, към подобряване на детското хранене. Ние направихме една поредица от дискусии, в които включихме представители на родителските общности, а, специалистите по хранене в отделните детски заведения, здравните институции на ниво регион. Като целият този процес беше инициран и модериран от общината. Проучихме становищата, мненията и така формирахме управленските политики, които общината осъществява. Втория ви въпрос още веднъж загубих. А, за модела. А, да, а, това, което в момента започваме да правим, е да пренесем същия този модел а, в ученическото хранене. Даже в почивката си говорихме с а, моята колега, която има на дете в училищна възраст и тя ми споделяше а, колко нездравословно е храненето там. Вече подадохме за финансиране проект по плана за възстановяване, в който искаме в едно от училищата да направим база за обединено хранене на деца в училищна възраст, а там а, да започнем, а, а, прилагайки този модел, а, производството на храни за децата от училищата и а, по същия този модел а, да а, увеличим горната възрастова граница за а децата във възраст от 7 до а, завършва от 7 години до завършване на средния курс. А, сега аз не бих коментирала конкретно който и да е град. А, между другото, аз съм заместник председател на Сдружението на общините и всички общини са ми скъпи. Ще кажа, че а, вече много колеги от страната идват при нас за да видят модела и заявяват намерение този модел да бъде пренесен в тяхната дейност. Особено в предизборния период, а колегите са доста активни. Yeah, first of all, thank you for this imp uh, impressive um, lecture, presentation. And my question is, you started with kind of a monitoring of the health uh, right from the beginning. So, and uh, is there still an ongoing monitoring? Do you uh, have 
uh, instruments to measure, I mean, the diets, okay, but also the impact on health of the children. Разбира се, че започнахме от това. А, в резултат на един а, сериозен анализ на а, състоянието на, детските, на детското здраве, тръгнахме в тази посока. Твърде кратък е периода, за да търсим въздействие. Това, че разбирате, това, че децата две години са яли екологично чисти плодове и зеленчуци, едва ли ще даде мигновен резултат. А, в интерес на истината, не толкова системни са усилията ни по отношение на мониторинга. Това предстои. Аз ви казах, че м- започнахме малко а, не толкова добре структурирано. Започнахме водени по-скоро от емоцията, от желанието да направим най-доброто за децата и постепенно вкарваме този управленски модел в една схема, която да му придава стройност. Ще ви призная, че имаме проблем с законодателството. А, на практика, за да влезем в рамките на закона, ние трябва да регистрираме общината като земеделски производител което ни създава много административни проблеми. Трябва да се регистрираме като производител на биохрани, което също ни създава много административни проблеми. А, вероятно това предстои. Водила съм разговор на ниво министър, замминистър в Министерство на земеделието, но този модел а, не е типичният пример за българската действителност. Ние го вървим крачка по крачка и вярваме, че в крайна сметка ще постигнем а, най-доброто решение. Имаше момент, в който бях заплашена от глоби за това, че в а, а, кухнята се внася храна, която не е минала а, обичайния ред, а, документиращ а храните, които се внасят в една детска кухня. Имахме случай, в което а, дружеството на пчеларите, вдъхновени от а, нашия опит, донесоха касетки с а, екологично чист мед и казаха, ние искаме да помогнем и ги оставиха в кабинета ни. След което технолога каза, моля ви се, не ги а, внасяйте в кухнята, ще ме глубят. А, да вървим стъпка по стъпка а, по този път и а, вярваме, че ще дадем, създадем един модел, който държавата ще признае като легитимен. Products that, for example, have been produced in school gardens to do something with cooking for the schools themselves. But it's not allowed to combine those two things. So that's really an issue. I still wanted to ask a last question to you uh, myself, if that's okay. Uh, we're, we're also talking in this session about exchange between cities and learning from other cities. Uh, in your presentation, at one moment, you mentioned that uh, Trujan was also a member of an uh, international project, this Urbex project, which also uh, uh, supported and helped the development of this model. Could you say a little bit more about what are the things that Trujan City got from this project and how it helped uh, you to be part of this exchange? Научихме какъв път са извървяли колеги в други страни. Както аз казах, за нас беше много интересен модела на Франция. Там аз видях как този модел се прилага в училищна възраст. Как децата, които излизат в междучасие, могат без проблем да се опитват плодове, произведени в овощните градини на училищата. Изключително поучително за мен беше това, че 
Френските колеги възпитават децата в уважение към храната. Там, примерно, плодовете се режат на малки парченца, за да може детето да изеде всичко, което слага в чинията си. В България сме малко разхитителни към храната и понякога даваме ябълките цели и детето изяжда половината ябълка, а другата я изхвърля. Разбира се, това, което винаги е полезно в такива проекти, е да опознаем трудностите, да видим и неуспешния опит, за да не го допускаме. Stay with us also for the, uh, the further discussion. Uh, Petra. Yeah. So I suggest that now we make a big leap. We go outside uh, of this place and uh, we go to New York. Uh, I told you before that we have this recorded message of uh, uh, Nevin Cohen, uh, who is a, a very renowned researcher on uh, urban agriculture food policies and has been very much involved in uh, the development of urban agriculture policies in the city of uh, New York. He was supposed to be with us at the conference, uh, also uh, virtual uh, yesterday, but that didn't work out. Uh, because of uh, connection uh, problems, but we have now received a recorded uh, presentation from him with also a video uh, connected to that. So I, I suggest that we, uh, uh, we, we jump to New York and uh, I want uh, to ask uh, the technician to start uh, the presentation and look into the experience of New York City. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nevin Cohen, and I'm a professor in the City University of New York School of Public Health, and I'm also the director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes uh, today to uh, talk to you about some urban agriculture policies that have been developed in New York City and uh, how thinking about them in an integrated fashion can help cities in Europe, uh, structure urban agriculture policies so that they're cohesive and that they um, are mutually supportive. When we think about urban agriculture policies, it's important to think about how they relate to different domains that are important to city government, from economic development to education to uh, sound and sustainable land use and also think about how policies in and of themselves can support multi-dimensional benefits that the city cares about. Um, these are what I've called nexus policies that address uh, issues like food production, energy conservation, water conservation, and uh, human development, all intertwined. Cities at their core uh, have a responsibility to manage land through zoning and planning and also building code regulations. This is a sort of you know, really traditional form of uh, policymaking for cities. In New York, our zoning has always allowed urban agriculture in all types of zones, residential, commercial, and manufacturing. And that has been a huge advantage uh, to the development and growth of urban agriculture in New York City because they haven't been, uh, farms and gardens are not restricted to particular zones of the, of the city. And in addition, our zoning allows food to be sold from farms and gardens in any district, even in a residential district where other commercial activity is prohibited. Uh, you can sell far, uh, farm produce from, from the farmer garden. And also in commercial zones, farms can sell not only the products that they grow, but also products produced off-site at their farms and gardens. Our building code has been 
revised to encourage rooftop urban agriculture. New or substantially renovated buildings have to be covered either by solar panels or a green roof system. And while the green roof system can be a passive green roof, uh, this building code has encouraged developers and architects to think about uh, creating buildings with, with uh, active food producing rooftops. Economic development is always a core issue in, in, in large cities and New York has uh, directed different agencies that are responsible for uh, providing spaces for entrepreneurs, providing financial support for new businesses to help support urban agriculture businesses. This, our, our current mayor, Mayor Adams, uh, when he was borough president of the borough of Brooklyn, uh, put out a report explaining why urban agriculture could be an important engine of economic development in New York City. And the city has provided resources like incubator space and other financial support for agritech startups. And the mayor has a vision that New York City will be uh, a, a center of innovation for urban agriculture technologies. This is one example on the screen, a, a fertilizer product that um, one small company has, has designed to sort of close the loop uh, and reduce uh, uh, the discarding of food waste and turning it into a, a valuable fertilizer. Other forms of economic support include direct support by the city to farms and gardens through, for example, free compost. Uh, the city also has an innovative program to turn the subterranean soil that is excavated for large-scale building projects that normally doesn't have any uh, nutrient value for, for crops. But by mixing that uh, uh, soil with organic matter, the city has, has really created a, a very valuable growing medium. And that's made available for free to gardens and farms throughout New York City. The city also has a green thumb program. That's an office in the city's parks department that manages all of the uh, hundreds of community gardens throughout the city, but also provides technical assistance and compost and other kinds of um, uh, help to community gardens. Uh, and that help is an enormous economic value to the gardeners uh, who are managing their sites. Another form of support is support for low-income New Yorkers who need help uh, paying for food. Uh, the city runs different programs, including, for example, uh, the image on the screen is a, a health buck program, which gives $2 for every $5 spent at farmer's markets. Now, New York City farmer's markets mostly sell produce grown in the peri-urban area or the rural areas of New York City. And they also sell food produced in New York City farms and gardens. For example, uh, the organization East New York Farms aggregates food grown uh, from dozens of farms in the neighborhood of East New York, Brooklyn, and uh, sells them at a farmer's market. And so residents who have these health bucks can get uh, additional value for their uh, uh, expenditures at, at those farmer's markets. Education is important to urban agriculture and urban agriculture is important to education. Uh, the city runs a, a farms and gardens that are connected to schools. New York City has a very large school system. We have a thousand school buildings and uh, about a million students in public school. And many of those schools now have, have gardens uh, connected to them. In addition, there are nonprofit organizations like the Green Bronx Machine uh, that provides um, uh, ways to teach science, technology, and environmental concepts to young children through urban agriculture, or Teens for Food Justice, a nonprofit that uses urban agriculture in high schools to teach young people about the social dimension, social justice dimensions of the food system, and uh, helps teach them how to grow food, but also how to advocate for fairer policies in the food system. Uh, the city has supported a variety of nexus policies. For example, the city's green infrastructure program, which is designed to help abate stormwater surges 
uh, and to reduce the impact of stormwater on the city's sewage treatment plants. And that program provides funding for private building owners or landowners to invest in urban farms. And so the cities sort of conceptualized their green infrastructure program as um, being able to support urban agriculture as a form of green infrastructure. The city also does sort of basic things like distributes rain barrels and, and cisterns to urban farms and gardens throughout the city also as a form of green infrastructure. New York also uh, helped fund a study in the neighborhood of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a low-lying neighborhood that uh, uh, tends to flood in major storms, uh, to think about redesigning the urban farms and gardens in that area to serve as a barrier to stormwater surges. Governance is critical to urban agriculture, and uh, the city has done a number of things to enhance the governance of urban farms and gardens. One is to require city agencies to proactively uh, inventory city-owned property for parcels that are appropriate for growing food and to make that list of publicly available so that community organizations and other nonprofits or entrepreneurs can find out where those parcels are available and to hopefully eventually turn them into farms and gardens. And the city in 2022 created a separate Office of Urban Agriculture within the office of the mayor to do a couple of things, to promote urban agriculture throughout New York City, but also to help integrate thinking about urban agriculture and supporting urban agriculture across the different uh, agencies that the mayor has um, uh, control over. And the city, as part of the law that required the creation of the Office of Urban Agriculture, ha has begun to form an urban agriculture advisory board with people from the urban ag industry, nonprofits, academics, and others. And so finally, uh, it's important to map out all of the different explicitly urban agriculture policies uh, in a particular city, but also some of the other policies that relate to urban agriculture, but aren't typically thought of as explicitly urban agriculture policies. For example, land use policies that can either present a barrier to urban agriculture or support urban agriculture education policies that might lend themselves to encouraging uh, school urban agriculture projects, economic uh, policies that can be directed at preferentially supporting urban agriculture businesses, uh, or nexus policies that grapple with multiple issues simultaneously uh, and, and, and uh, help the city to think about urban agriculture as an activity, a land use, and a physical infrastructure that can produce multiple co-benefits that different agencies from the Department of Sanitation to the Environmental Protection or Water Department can benefit from. But thank you very much. I'm sorry I, I couldn't be um, with you in person or live, but feel free to reach out to me. This is my email address, and I hope to continue this conversation in the future. Have a great conference. Big round of applause for Nevin. I will pass on the applause to him uh, by email afterwards. <laughs> well, of, I don't want to dedicate now a big question session to this, also in view of the time, but I thought it would be useful to present this because it gives, of course, the reality is very different. It's a very big metropolitan uh, city, but it gives a very comprehensive overview of the different types of uh, urban agriculture policies that you can use in a city and in that sense I hope that it also uh, can be inspiring and give you maybe thoughts on what you can do in your own cities. But uh, without further ado we've still got two cities that we do have here so we do want to want to talk with them so I want to ask uh, Francesco and Gorm uh, from Torino and uh, Copenhagen to take uh, the floor. And first of all, uh, Francesco, that he tells us something about 
the experience of the city of Turin, especially the strategy for urban food gardening. Um, technique and put the presentation, it's already there. Francesco, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, so good morning. I am Francesco Tres, I'm a deputy mayor. Okay, yeah, just because I have to, to speak, so. I'm deputy mayor uh, of the municipality of Turin. Uh, okay. Sorry, too complicated. <laughs> okay, and uh, I'm in charge of, uh, well, several duties anyway, uh, the most important is uh, green uh, and uh, um, everywhere is collected to agriculture, um, urban agriculture. In my speech I will touch this uh, sequence uh, of points, uh, above all uh, uh, just to analyze uh, the data and the scale of uh, metropolitan area. Then uh, how is important the urban green uh, for the city of Turin, the typology and the rules uh, of urban gardening, and then uh, uh, what we are working on, uh, the potential of urban gardening and trying to um, define new models also of uh, urban gardening. This is the metropolitan area of Turin. Uh, you consider about uh, 20 municipalities around Turin. And uh, you see that uh, the number, the figures uh, related to woods, uh, to agricultural crops and to green areas are relevant. We are about uh, uh, 115 uh, square kilometers of uh, crops, agricultural crops. It uh, uh, corresponds to about uh, among 20% of the whole uh, comprehensive uh, um, surface. And uh, um, also considering uh, the agricultural crops in Turing, also in the, in the, in the surface of uh, our town, we have about uh, um, 52 uh, square kilometers and uh, more than 300 urban farms. Um, also the type of crops are uh, cereal, forage, uh, leguminous, and so on. And, uh, uh, well, just to see that, uh, um, in fact, it's a quite important and relevant also activities and also in terms of economics uh, for our town. Our town, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, is uh, is a typical industrial town is the site of the Fiat company car. But consider that uh, at the end of the 70s, there were more than 80,000 workers employed at the Fiat. Nowadays, they are less than 8,000. So it means that also we have to, uh, to, to, to have a different uh, vision, different identity of the town. And uh, play also the agriculture, urban agriculture in terms of green uh, can play also an important role in terms of uh, a circular economy, in terms of uh, something which is related, strictly related to the sustainability of, uh, of uh, the economy of our town. Uh, um, there is a lack of a, a picture anyway, uh, just to show you that also the urban grazing is a practice that we have al already uh, practiced from several years, and uh, uh, it is also a, um, a good practice because uh, uh, grazing animals in our parts uh, uh, in order to maintain natural spaces uh, is also a common view to see sheep, uh, to see cows and uh, goats uh, in our parts. Uh, we, owns, uh, we own also several um, farms. This, for example, is Cascina Falchera in Turin. Um, it is run by a cooperative. And uh, uh, the project, the project provided uh, to the administration from the cooperative, um, enhanced the possibility to um, involve a local community, uh, especially thinking at the school, kindergarten, but not only. Also, there are courses for adults or family, and uh, um, they are very active, uh, um, providing multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, also advisory. Uh, in terms of uh, gardening, in terms of uh, um, nutrition, good nutrition, they are all uh, very important. Also, um, food policy related to, to the activities of the farm. Uh, they have greenhouses, they have stables, so it's very important also for the school 
because it's really in the heart of Turin, uh, in, in a boundary area, but anyway, uh, very easy also to, to rise, for, for, to, to reach the, the, the farm from the, from the school, and they are very, very uh, important in, in our program also for the education. This is the green infrastructure of Turin. Uh, you can Im immediately have the idea that uh, um, Turin is crossed by four rivers, the main thing which is the Po River, uh, which flows from uh, south to north, and uh, it's three tributaries. And uh, this is important because um, uh, rivers and all the green system along the courses are ideal corridor of um, uh, biodiversity. And they can collect all the, the green areas spread uh, over um, on the town and on the, 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 the municipality around the, uh, around the town to the green uh, hill, which is the green spot on the, on the right banks of the, of the river Po. And uh, so it's uh, really uh, also in terms of surface um, is important. Uh, and consider that uh, the 37% of the surface of Turing is composed by green area. So it's quite important. Um, also, a number, uh, if you consider the population that nowadays is something like 870,000, it means that uh, it corresponds to uh, uh, 40 square meters per person, and uh, almost a half of this uh, green is public green. Yeah, you have the idea. Also, um, it's important to say that uh, uh, Turin is uh, an urban MAB. MAB is a recognition of UNESCO. Uh, the, it's a acronym uh, which means man and biosphere. And there are few urban MAB uh, in the world. We are the only one in Italy. I am the honor to be the president of this uh, um, recognition, this association. There are 80 municipality joined by this uh, association. Uh, and um, the aim is really to recognize that uh, there is an important relevancy of the biosphere of this territory, despite the fact that we are in a very anthrop uh, anthropic area, industrial uh, town, but uh, we have to maintain uh, and we have a program uh, in terms of uh, uh, enhance uh, the possibility of uh, sustainable tourism, sustainable food policies, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, which will in develop uh, and so on. So it's quite interesting also. That just some features uh, summarized here, but you can see also that uh, uh, the rate of uh, green public space per inhabitant is uh, near, uh, nearby, nearby uh, 22 square meters. It's a quite good average. Uh, we have uh, a lot of public gardens, more than 350 uh, among 50 parts. 300 kilometers or three line boulevard. This is typical of the landscape of Turin, this the big avenue uh, with three lines. And this is urban gardening data. Um, we are two different kind of urban gardening, uh, vegetable gardening. And uh, um, the, the, the two model uh, I will show you uh, in, in the next slides, seven district models and uh, 22 associative model. Uh, they involve uh, a significant number of people. Uh, the majority of them are elderly people, retired people. MAP is increasing the number of young people, young couples, young families that ask, and uh, the demand of uh, young people is really increasing. That's a good, uh, uh, I think, um, that uh, information. Also because uh, after the, the pandemic, uh, uh, the number of uh, local community uh, recognized in the sharing a gardening activity as a social moment of sharing uh, inclusion, of sharing activities and the culture also, and so on. So this is the first typology of this modern, so the urban garden uh, plot uh, as owned by the municipality. All the, the, the data I show you are related to uh, public uh, green areas and allocated to a singular citizen for a personal production. So there are rules, but uh, the, the, I mean, there is a correspondence be, between the municipalities and the single um, own um, person who, or family who rent the, the, the plot. These are typical um, examples of this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, gardening. 
the typology two is an associative urban garden. And so the urban garden plots owned by the municipality is allocated uh, to an association that amplify the potential of urban uh, garden programs. So we have a, a specific allotment and uh, we are in a relationship directly be between the association, which are a, a sort of uh, um, accelerator of uh, urban community and that provide also services to the uh, association. I will show uh, very fast two kind of uh, this uh, association. The first one is ORME. ORME is uh, a sort of network uh, among a different uh, um, urban gardening. It's a second level organization and uh, uh, bring together different organizations, NGOs, associations, social cooperatives, social enterprises and other uh, stakeholders of the territory. And they are active in urban agriculture to promote collaboration to design common agenda from bottom-up perspective. Um, they are very important for us. They are a sort of advisor for the municipality because they follow us also in uh, uh, reply some uh, experiments, some uh, model. And uh, um, uh, for ORME, the urban, uh, ORME is acronymous also of uh, ORTI, ORTI is gardening, Metropolitani, or ORME is uh, or Metropolitan ORME uh, gardening. And uh, um, also they provide service in terms of uh, environmental education, horticultural therapy, drum sun gardening directly in the um, public hospitals or nearby and they have a program together with the, the health management of the, of the hospital. Uh, beekeeping, social inclusion, job placement and urban development. So uh, it's a very important player for us, this network of associations. And also they provide uh, some project, uh, for example, this is very interesting, farm your root, uh, rooftop. Uh, they are a sort of advisory also for local private uh, communities that want to install gardening in the roof, uh, on the roof, on the top, in boxes or, uh, or crate uh, like, like, like this. Uh, other example, um, Ortus Conclusus, uh, uh, in the context of the private uh, area, and uh, they provide also service in this. Uh, of course, uh, they work uh, strictly together with uh, the, the schools and uh, the kingdom of, uh, uh, of Turin. Another example is Orti Generali. It is placed in uh, Mirafiori. Mirafiori is exactly the neighborhood where the major plant of Fiat car is installed. So it's a very wide area. And uh, uh, directly near uh, the plant of the Fiat Mirafiori, uh, they start uh, um, building a social enterprise model for the transformation and management of residual urban agricultural areas. It was an area um, where, uh, how can you say, um, it was a, a, a sort of dump, and there were uh, illegal activities, and uh, so um, the, the, the municipality uh, granted an announcement for, for, the, for Rani to, to develop this project, and um, this association provided a very interesting uh, project. Uh, the result of, the, of this project, after four years of participatory design, uh, involving school association, gardeners of Fiori, this number. Um, and now uh, it is also a, a very interesting location because in a very interesting place, but near the banks of the Sangone River, so in a quite of natural uh, island uh, in a very uh, anthropic area. And uh, um, so today uh, the area is completely renovated and um, also uh, they, they run uh, a very good uh, program of farming. Uh, there are s uh, 170 gardens plus uh, uh, an educational center, uh, plots plus an educational center, uh, where courses may be taken. And uh, here you can see also some images. This is the area of the gardens. And uh, um, it's interesting to see on the upper pictures how was the area, the dumps, and onto the buildings refurbish it on the, on, in the down picture, also the area I represent today. Uh, also, they, this is a sketch uh, of, of, of the area, the garden and the, the central um, common area on the river banks. Also, um, they done uh, um, a very good uh, project in terms also of uh, refurbish and how to design uh, um, the, the, um, the huts, the, the, the checks, 
um, like in uh, Krakow, you know, so we have <laughs> this problem that uh, not ever is, uh, a, a, I mean, the best architectural practice <laughs> in the design the, the huts. And the principle they want to follow is to be um, w all the, the installation um, are removing. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the principle that uh, in a future time, we can also decide to have another destination of this area. Um, it's, on the, uh, it's important to, 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 to the principle is that uh, it's in wood, it's uh, in sustainable and natural uh, materials, but also it's possible uh, tomorrow to, to remove them. Um, well, and to end uh, the... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to finish. The garden rule. So we started in 2013, 10 years ago, uh, the administration to develop a specific regulation. And the aims is uh, also these are the, 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 the topics. So we can uh, provide the areas, uh, plots of 50 and 100 square meters. There are some fee to pay, of course. Uh, and the allotment grants uh, uh, are renewed for periods of five years. Uh, now, this is the typical example. And so we are. Uh, uh, working at the upgrading of these rules. This has the objective, also now the values of space by removing them from degradation to give them the equality for areas, uh, areas for agriculture, improve the urban quality, support sociality and citizen participation, uh, teach cultivation techniques, support the production, also promote uh, education and also uh, innovation. Just uh, an example, uh, we installed some meters uh, on the ground uh, to, in order to measure the, the level of the humidity of the soil according to the weather forecast, a little a simple software, uh, can um, show how much water can regulate the water for irrigation. And this is demonstrated after one year of experimentation that we can save uh, more or less 60% of the water. In, in that period, affording the, the, the drought that for two years, sequentially, we will afford, we tackle this year, it's also a, a signal that uh, we have also to, to pay attention, very, very attention to this practice. These are other examples. And uh, to end, uh, we are now working to a new innovation model together with the association and with the stakeholders uh, in order to co-design uh, innovative processes for a new urban garden, garden and also innovative uh, governance model, also model of governance, in order to enhance uh, the activity in terms of social technology innovation. That's all, thank you, and uh, of course, I wait you in tuning for the next edition of the European Forum. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for explaining the experience of uh, Torino. And, well, in, in view of time, I, I suggest that we go directly yeah. to uh, Copenhagen, after which we can maybe have a more general discussion. So the floor is to Gorm Fliborg, who will uh, say something about the experience with school gardens in Torino. First of all, if we can get up to the slides. Yes. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to par participate and to address this conference. There have been some very interesting days and uh, some very Im important and interesting posts on the subject. My contribution in this context is to open a view for how school gardens can contribute to these pe perspective and at the same time give a view of how it has been politically possible to get school gardens accepted as a part of green development in Copenhagen and be a part of city of Copenhagen's strategy for sustainability. But first, what is Copenhagen school garden in a context, in a Danish context? School gardens. just have to look at the picture. School gardens in Denmark started about uh, 1903 uh, and it started to spread out over the D Danish country with a starting point 
where a head teacher was sent out in Europe by the Minister of Education to find the best practice of school gardens and take that knowledge back to Denmark and start implementing in the Danish elementary and primary schools. Back in Denmark, he founded the association School Garden, which consists of teachers from the Danish schools all over the country, and they took on the responsibility of spreading out school gardens in Denmark and sharing knowledge of best practice about operation and teaching in school gardens. In the next 50 years, school gardens were spread out in the whole of Denmark with that effect that it was possible for nearly every pupil in the Danish elementary school to have education outside in the school garden. During the interval years, school gardens in Denmark became increasingly popular as a very physical health school to promote social skills and civic in, in engagement uh, in the society, such as and how to know how to grow food and to promote a sense of responsibility and respect for the nature. In the, and by the way, which is very important here, in the financial crisis in the 30s and during the Second World War, the war it was a very, very important subsidy of food for, for, the, for the Danish households. But in the 60s and 70s, the urbanization and is gaining momentum. The, the, the urbanization where everybody moved into town, the industrialization who surrounded the towns with factories, with new buildings, uh, a new kind of labor uh, uh, was needed. Uh, and that happens at the same time as the political focus of what primary schools could should focus on was changing. In order to meet the need for skilled labor force with a focus of the growing indus industrialization, they have become more focused on academic curriculum and less focused on practical learning in the primary and the elementary schools. These two dynamics, the urbanizations, the movements from the rural areas to the towns and the, the and, and the, the industrializations uh, and the new look of what, what children should learn in school did that mostly of the Danish school garden disappeared. In the cities, the school gardens uh, uh, areas uh, connected to the, to the elementary schools, the land was used for, for building new houses, for daycare institutions, for, for new office building, so actually most of the land for school garden disappeared at that time. And what then happens to the association Danish School Garden, which actually had that success, spreading out school gardens in whole Denmark for all the Danish people, that brings us back to Copenhagen and Copenhagen School Garden. The remains of this association, the Dan Copenhagen School Gardens, is, uh, School Garden in Denmark is what Copenhagen School Garden is today. What have happened then is that we have some few areas left in Copenhagen where we have school gardens. We have about, we had in Copenhagen about something like 35, hectares of school gardens. Today we have seven left. But then there's a political change and now we are in Copenhagen School Garden have a, have a political backed up mission by the municipality that we should have school gardens for every Copenhagen pupil uh, in the elementary schools. But how did that happen? How did that return of the Jedi happen, as I say? What happens is that around 2000, a new culinary uh, discourse is starting called New Nordic Cuisine. 
I don't know if anybody ever heard about it, but it was very famous. It went international, and the politician get very interested. And then, at the same time, in the political discourse, we are starting talking about healthy nutrition for schools and for daycare institutions. So what they did was they formed an institution called the Danish Malhus, the Danish Food House. And what they should do was producing healthy meals for daycare institutions and for schools and train personnel in canteens, in daycare institutions and schools to make healthy food and it should be based on organic, locally produced crops and vegetables. And that was also to stimulate the organic growing farms around Copenhagen so you could get that market to expand. And that was really a success. Today, 90% of all the canteens in, and, and the daycare institution and schools are supplied uh, uh, with organic uh, food and produce as healthy meat. And the children is involved many places in the production. So what then happens is when this institution is built from a, from a political in, initiative from the Copenhagen municipality, out in a, the biggest of the leftover school gardens, a girl starts as a volunteer having this leisure school gardens as left, and she, she is a teacher student, and she sees the pot potential of having to teach outside with the pupils from the Copenhagen schools. At the same time, she is in a network with, with people from Copenhagen Food House, and they make a plan together. And then they get political accept that for the next four years, they have to try to make outdoor teaching in school garden so the children know where the food come from. That's one of the focus Nordic cuisines, where does the food come? Okay, organic food. How? But then there's a new thing happening. <clears throat> because we have a school reform. You know, politi politicians love reform and change everything. But in the <clears throat> In the school reform, there's a new way, a new look on what pupils shall learn. We are going back to more practical skills. We are going back to open up the, the school from the surroundings. We are, we are going back to that children should be teach in outdoor uh, environment. And that brings the school bar garden back on the agenda. But the, then there is a change for what we, what the goal of the school garden is, because now it's not only a goal to the pupils for learn how to grow crops and know where the food is coming from. Now we have a didactic and pedagogic views on what can we do in nature surrounding cultivating nature into food. When you have these, when you have these child in outdoor education, you are having all the curriculum. You are having math, you are having language, you are having nature, you are having science. At the same time, you are having art, you have to draw the crops, you have to make drawings of, of the fields, you have to divide areas up where you should plant different things. So all in all, the whole curriculum is in front of the pupils in natural surroundings, and it makes sense for, for, the, for the pupils to learn the things. It's not divided into columns. You're using the whole thing. And half, 
half a bar a bucket, a whole bucket, that math, that makes sense. But why is outdoor teaching working? When you use your senses, when you use your body learning things, then your brain will make big memories for you. Not like sitting as a lecturer like here, where we will, where we will tend to forget everything when we went out of the, of, of the door. But when you're beat out in outdoor surroundings, your cortisol level is going down, you're getting less stress, you are having, a, you are having one of the best, the best surrounding for learning things because that's where your brain was parked 10,000 years ago in the evolu evolution. So we change our goals not only to say where does food come from, come from but we, we were working with how can we enroll and use the green learning spaces in the best way. And we did that in cooperation with the teachers and with scientists in Denmark who have now made a lot of knowledge about how does outdoor teaching work the best. Can you, can you wrap up, Colin? <clears throat> but then on top of that, of the better learning conditions, there's something happening when you're out in nature. When you're out in that maximum of bacteria that is out there, you get them in the stomach and then you get a good immune defense and you get a good microbiome so your brain will work much better. <clears throat> so what is the facts about Copenhagen school gardens? Yes, as, you, as I said, we had, we are in, over the long run, we, were, we, we had 35 hectares, now we're down to seven. Mm -hmm. We have to expand again. The politician is trying to help us find new areas. That's very di difficult because they also have to find money. But it's slowly going on. We have just expanded from covering 10% of, of, of the, the amount of pupils in Copenhagen to nearly 20%. So in mm -hmm. the next 10 years, we hope that we can cover the whole uh, Copenhagen needs for school gardens. But you know, every time there is some area, everybody wants to use it for buildings, for industry, for just to leave it alone as nature. So. It will take some time and will be very difficult. But right now, we have about 50 school classes from May to October who's growing crops in the, in the school garden. And they're coming every week for three and a half hours because that's what we know from, from science. That's what's recommended if we shall have a good learning session in the green classroom. So all in all, we have also 40 daycare centers coming with their children because we have bring this one step further. We are not sitting around the table at home and talk about nature. We are not sitting around table at home talking with our children about where does the food come from. So. When you have to cheat small children, you have to build on their understanding. If they have some understanding, you can build on top of that. It's like a ladder you, you go up on. You can end up on a PhD level at the end in many, many years. But you have to start with a very simple understanding. So that's why we take in the daycare children to have that start. So they start to find out what's nature, where does food come from. They start to find out that nature is a companion you have to live on and live together with in a symbiosis. That's, it's not a resource. 
that's a very important thing for their future, that they know it's not just a hole in, in earth and then you can bring up oil and burn it. Yeah. Great. It's something you have to work together with and have to respect. So actually, you can say we're going back to what school garden was many years ago. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so the, can, you, can you give, a, can you give a final message, go on? Can you give a final Yes, conclusion? I'm just coming there. Because I would like to start the vision they had one, 100 years ago when they founded the school gardens and then they were sitting down smoking cigars and drinking cognac and coffee and then they found out that on every school entrance to the school garden with big flames written that should be in, in, in Latin, Maximo Consideratio Debitu Affilius, which means the greatest consideration is due to the children because it's their future. Yeah. That was a little about the politics in Copenhagen and the Danish school gardens. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you very much, Garm, for sharing this experience about Copenhagen and also reminding us again how important it is to be outside, to uh, use school gardens, to learn to be in nature, to live together with nature. And, well, I hope that if we leave this conference that we did not forget everything, that we will still <laughs> also uh, um, remember things, but it's also... Uh, uh, very nice to see how things are increasing again. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Okay, so these were the different uh, uh, presentations of the different uh, cities. Of course, we are behind schedule, um, but at the same time, I think it's also important that we take time for this exchange. This is in the end what we are all uh, doing things about. Uh, exchange and to really understand what are the different local experiences also needs time needs time to understand and explain what is re really happening in the different places but it still means that we do have uh, just restricted time now uh, for a final uh, session we were originally thinking to do an interactive session to get out some lessons from this conference but I think that is going to be too short um, but we can maybe make some kind of intermediate form uh, what we do want to have no we've got let's say let's start from the back the restriction is that we need to be half past one in the canteen if not we're not going to eat so that's all a collective interest we also want to hear some final conclusions, some final remarks, especially from the project coordinator. So for that, we also need to have some time. But at the same time, it is important to uh, draw some lessons together, I think, as well, to uh, share the experience, to share lessons. Um, and the best thing is maybe not to do that in a big group, but to go in uh, a number of smaller groups I don't know, uh, uh, I'm looking to Patricia. How much groups? Yeah, yeah. Yes, hi. What we had thought for this uh, final session was to actually um, have your views, your thoughts on the conference in general, what you are taking home with you, the main aspects, main lessons that you've learned, and also what suggestions, recommendations you have for us in the EFWA for a project, for your cities, for your regions or nations, and for the EU. Now, we ideally we would have gone outside and you know filled in some posters and things but we don't have that time to that. so we can do it here if you like i can just collect ideas on post-it notes and put them on the posters if that's okay with you or or, or you an prefer? option would be that we divide in two groups one yeah. we talk about what can cities do together exactly. and another one maybe some more general yeah. uh, takeaways and also lessons for uh, next yeah. step for we can, the we can stay here in the room we just we are 
half of us go to the front and half of us go to the back. And we've got a space behind the... As well, yes, and we gather the ideas and just very quickly, 10, 15 minutes, no more, so then we can have just a wrap up. And then uh, Daniel Munderal and Donna, who's online, will have the closing speeches. That's okay. Yes. So that way we can actually finish on time and go to the canteen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. So the people who want to talk about the future of cities exactly. and exchanges, so, uh, where? Exactly. We can, like, behind the scenes there, we just take one flip chart there and we just take some ideas on who wants to give suggestions for the future. We'll just go at the back. Who wants to instead give uh, their feedback on the conference, the contents and what they're taking home with them from this conference, we can stay this side of the room. So let's yeah. Uh, what time is it now? Let's say 15 minutes from now. What time is it now? It's now quarter to uh, it's, Let's say one. Quarter, quarter to one. At one o'clock here, we have a five minutes uh, wrap up and then the closing speeches by Daniel and Donna. Is that okay? Yes. That it works for everyone? That's okay, a plan. perfect. So, uh, who wants to come with me for the future at the back? Okay, and who stays here with Petia here? Okay, and just take the post its and put them there. We'll just improvise. Thank you. Final ah. attention. <laughs> it's okay, no worries, no worries. We'll okay, so we'll have a very quick wrap up with two minutes of what each group has been discussing to then give the floor to Donna, who's online, and Daniel for the closing speeches. Thank you. And then straight for lunch. So, who wants to, uh, the first group, what, what are you taking home from this conference? Yeah, it was our. Pecha, pecha. Okay. Actually, we were in the first uh, group uh, reflecting on the, what we take as a message from, uh, from the conference and we discover several things. The first, and from my perspective, one of the most important is that we still need to speak about what is urban agriculture and what, uh, why this needs to be recognized as a specific issue different from the food uh, systems and food issues uh, because it seems that there are uh, it is almost not so well known as a uh, as a concept. Well, we need also to have specific regulations at city level uh, to practice more effectively urban agriculture, but also more advice at local level to practitioners how to do that and uh, uh, how to be well organized and uh, so on. Uh, we need also to bring more different perspectives to the issue of urban agriculture and to explain uh, this concept as a multifunctional concept, not only about agriculture, not only about food, but also about different social perspectives. Uh, we also find that uh, urban agriculture is quite diverse. There are many diversity from western to eastern part and also from northern to, e uh, to southern part. But we really need to ask commission to recognize this diversity of urban agriculture and to support diversities and not to try to homogenize the, um, uh, the, the concept. And the last point, probably we have many more, but last that urban agriculture can be practiced either top down or bottom up or a, a mixture of both type of approaches. And yeah, uh, there is a future to develop it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Petra, for this. Uh Sorry, so basically the, 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 um, the outcomes actually merge because in our group about what has to be done for the future, what do we see in the future, we need, okay, very clear, make land available. I think that was a common problem in most of the cities, land available in the terms that easy access for citizens because there is land, but how to get access to it, that's more complicated. For that, you need clear rules on how to develop, how to access land, how to develop urban gardens. And up to here, we were very clear and very much, you know, all aligned. And this is where things got complicated because we need to raise awareness in citizens. 
and provide information to citizens. In other words, to take Daniel's words, how do we convert the non-believers? How do we bring them into our church of urban agriculture? So here you have the role of associations from one side. You have the role of mm, informative platforms as well, where people can have access, as Zoe was mentioning, uh, information processes and practices, okay? If, if perhaps dialogue with cities is not easy, then people can access a platform. Sometimes people online find more information, it, it happens more often than we would expect, than actually trying to find somewhere in the city administration to speak to. That can be a challenge in some cities. Uh, and then we have, again, information to be transferred from one city to another city within the same countries. We have very uh, virtuous cities in one country and other cities have no idea of what is happening next door. So here come into place national networks, okay? So emphasize the role of national uh, networks, which means the whole family of networks. We say national, we mean also European networks, worldwide networks. We have hundreds and thousands of them. The overall goal is to reach out to these people here, these guys here, the EU. What we want at the end, we all want, the two groups, is to have the EU recognize the value of urban agriculture, not the existence, because I think they have pretty clear that it exists. We have shown them many times in, through many projects that uh, urban agriculture exists, okay? But what is the value? Because recognizing the value means to have then top-down, proper rules and recognition. So, okay, so plenty of uh, meat in the grill, I think, <laughs> for the next few months for FUA to think about and, and gather all that together and propose then a policy brief and recommendations and knock on doors, as I was saying the other day, to Frank Lorberg. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I would give... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Donna is online, perhaps? Hello? Good to see you. you can hear me. Hink, I couldn't hear what you last said. I think your microphone was off. But I did hear that we need to bring the networks together, if I made that, made that right. Um, well, thank you again for having me on the screen. Um, just a, a very quick um, expression of my feelings and um, what I, I take home after these three days watching you online and, and then a few just organizational thank yous. Um, but um, apart from uh, many things that were already mentioned uh, in terms of all the topics we have covered and all the important um, directions in which we um, have outlined that we need to work, um, I say what um, I am very impressed with is the quality of um, dedication that I saw in everybody who spoke. Um, and starting from um, what I shared in that 
first address that Svetla read um, on my behalf. Um, I'm very content that we've got the targets now pretty much settled where we want to go with the European Agriculture um, uh, Forum. I'm also very content and excited that we've got a wealth of knowledge coming from all different types of actors that we have seen represented during this conference. Um, and mostly, I, I see the the passion and the dedication that drives you all. Um, and uh, I think this is the most important part because it, we have a job in ahead of us uh, with the forum and further in our common work, uh, establishing uh, more links and more networks and, and more efficient work between ourselves. And from a sociological point of view and my personal interest in social capital, whenever we need to start a network, it's usually one person who, uh, it, it takes one person to inspire uh, and to lead. And I see in you um, and, uh, and in our speakers, those people. Um, and um, this, is, this is really optimistic to me. Uh, now, uh, I, I want to also say thank you for all of you coming from near and far, uh, from even outside uh, Europe to Bulgaria and to Sofia. Thank you so much to our moderators, to our note takers, to the technical uh, team, and of course to Petya and Svetla, who have been um, trying their best to cover up for the my flaws in organization and to um, uh, Galia and Mariana and Eva and Kalina who have been holding everything together um, and um, to the online participants as well the questions we got they have been forwarded on um, and um, hope to see you all next time in Brussels and if you allow me now I'm not I'm not so I don't have a stay that much in the organization but uh, I would suggest after Daniel will also hear Frank if he's still there uh, to uh, to also give his final words so yes thank you very much uh, again and and see you soon Thanks for these uh, remarks, uh, Donna, and of course also a very, 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 very big thank you for Donna, who unfortunately could not be here with us, but who has made all this to a large extent possible. So also a big applause again for Donna for <laughs> taking this here. So the last word is for Daniel. He's got already a microphone, so I'll leave the floor for him. Yes, thank you very much, Hank and Donna. And now it's up to me to come up with some final remarks. Um, yeah, how can I wrap up, sum up all the food for thought that has been served throughout this conference? Um, I still like to think in themes, and I would highlight a couple of findings from um, the city presentations because they provided us with, with pretty good overall perspectives. I mean, Sofia, it was all about setting this, the stage. We've heard about the trajectories, sustainability, urban resilience, so, and I think um, agriculture becomes way more powerful when it is embedded under these umbrella terms. On the other hand, we've also seen this example for putting urban agriculture on the map make it visible within the urban landscape but also make it visible to people um, who are not familiar with it right now preaching to the converted but also um, yeah um, raising awareness for it in general Thessaloniki it was about experimenting we've seen an example of an urban vineyard so this wasn't possible many years ago that's a completely new way of rethinking food growing in the city, so be confident, experiment with urban agriculture. We had Krakow, the idea of upscaling, how can we come from food growing on a balcony to an overall um, vision of an, of an edible city, also the idea of exchange, mutual exchange within um, countries, but also on an international level. The idea of um, food networks, of city networks, um, was resonating in this talk, and I think this is a really good point. We've intensively discussed this um, during the World Cafe. Trojan, it was all about um, health. How can we monitor the impacts, the benefits of um, urban agriculture? And I mean, health, we take it for granted. It's so obvious good food is a resource for health, but I think this 
is a topic we need to make it visible somehow and it's, it, it underlines, it gives um, urban agriculture way more power when we think about all these countless benefits again. Torino, Bella, Citta. Um, for me it was interesting again, coming back to this idea of models, typologies, um, I look at it from a scientific perspective, but on city level it also makes sense to sort of develop these models um, like the Horti Generali or the Citizen Garden and then um, showcase people or, or, or make offers which are like um, tailored around the needs of different target groups. In between we hopped over to the Big Apple and um, this idea of Nexus policies was really prominent. It's again this multiple benefits approach and how can we um, put uh, urban agriculture on the map for policy makers and I think um, there were a couple of very good examples also this idea of zoning. Frank and me have discussed this a lot. Do we need priority zones dedicated to urban agriculture, for example, building codes So New York um, was certainly also a next practice um, in this regard. And finally, Copenhagen, a trip down memory lane for me. I was involved in a school garden group actually, and um, I think it paved way for my career choice later on, so I took full benefit of it. And um, finally, coming back to this idea of sustainability, does it make any sense to think about sustainability without future generations in mind? And what can be more sustainable than the propagation, the education of um, young, new, Gardeners, so I think um, we covered a lot of different themes and I'm happy to hear that on city level the potential of urban agriculture is already unlocked and now what's uh, yeah, ahead of us is the real challenge, how can we um, yeah, articulate ourselves, how can we communicate the message to the people in Brussels, how can we inform the policy makers and luckily we don't need this answer right now, there seems to be no like silver bullet solution to this challenging task, but we've discussed a, a, a couple of um, strategies. So we could prepare our messages in a way that can be understood by the people in Brussels. This would involve thinking in these silos, boxes, jurisdictions. I think this is something we can do because Hank has prepared this map. Otherwise, we also had more revolutionary ideas like creating a manifesto for urban agriculture, for example, to not only speak in this bureaucratic language, but really articulate ourselves in a way this can be, which can be understood by the public. And um, yeah, I think we also have this final vision video, which will be produced by Mahmoud um, at the very end of the project. And yeah, finding the overall story, we want to tell this narrative. How do we want um, to look urban agriculture in the future. This is still a very nice task and we can work on this, um, uh, on this beautiful platform and I think this whole conference really emphasized, underlined and highlighted the necessity of more communication, more exchange um, in the world of urban agriculture. And so it was a pleasure for me. Thanks again for everybody for being here. Special thanks to Donna and her team and a big applause right now. Thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Daniel, for closing. We need to go to the canteen. <laughs> now, now, now. So we'll see each other there, and we will talk, and we will socialize. <laughs> yeah, bring back your headphones uh, when you leave uh, the, the place. Don't forget to leave things. Yeah.